I'm Julian. So today we're going to talk about um, efficient formats for analytics with uh, Parquet and Arrow. So I work at uh, Dremio and um, uh, I used to work at Twitter where I created Parquet in collaboration with um, the Impala team. Um, I'm on several PMC so at the Apache Foundation and today in particular I'm going to talk about uh, Parquet and Arrow. So to give you a summary, so um, first I'm going to talk about community and how it's important to integrate in the ecosystem and build a community and collaborate with other projects. And then I'll deep dive into the benefits of columnar formats and the specifics of uh, Parquet and Arrow. And then I'll talk a little bit about what will be coming next. So first, if, um, if we reminisce for a little bit and we talk about uh, Parquet, so some few years ago, uh, there was a common need for col a columnar format for storing data, right? So in the analytics world, we had HDFS in the Hadoop, and uh, um, you, know, you have this big file system and you have a lot of files, flat files, it makes it a little hard to do database optimizations. And so Parquet came from uh, the existing, you know, technologies existing in Vertica, all those, uh, that uh, columnar based storage layers uh, for parallel databases. And so the idea was to make Hadoop less of a file system and more of a database. So I was starting from the bottom up, looking at the, fi at the file format and prototyping something. The Impala team at Cloudera was prototyping something also for Impala because they needed a better, more efficient representation for their query engine. And so we started collaborating on that and we made Parquet. And then from then on, several companies started being interested. Uh, the Criteo, based in France, uh, did the Hive integration. Uh, Netflix started using it as a, their main storage and did the Presto integration. And then slowly, Drill, the Apache Drill project started looking into it as a file format and we collaborated, including their, the types they needed in the, in the spec. And then Spark SQL started using it and we didn't even hear about it, they just used it. So at some point, you know, it snowballed and uh, uh, Parquet started being the standard for columnar representation in Hadoop. It's the most uh, integrated columnar format and kind of became the de facto standard for that. And so this happened because there was a common need and there was good collaboration being open about including uh, other people requirements in the format. And, you know, and it was a success. So Arrow comes from the common need of having a columnar representation in memory. Because if you look at MonetDB and uh, the existing research on uh, vectorized execution for databases, that's the next step, right? The next step all those query engines on top of Hadoop are looking at is how to use a columnar in-memory representation to speed up their execution. And so the advantage is now we built a community around Parquet already. All those query engines have been collaborating, uh, discussing how certain time types, for example, should be represented in Parquet. And that's a big uh, starting point for agreeing on what the memory format should be and uh, having a standard one instead of 10 different ones. So big benefits is share the effort and of course create an ecosystem. And instead of having individual things that need to be integrated, uh, well, we have one and there's also a lot of benefits from that. So Parquet, um, sorry, Arrow started uh, last year. Uh, it was announced as a top level Apache project uh, in February. And you know, we listed a bunch of, uh, we have people from all those projects on the PMC. And one of the key things from the beginning is make sure uh, we had a consensus on what the representation should be so that we agree on what it is and we start with a common representation and then we develop from that. And I'll, I'll go into details on how vectorized execution uh, makes things faster and um, you know, some of the details of the project. 
So I've been talking about you know, why it's important to make it a standard. So if we look at before, so there have been several um, projects trying out uh, columnar and uh, vectorized execution. And if we look at the picture on the right, um, well, every time you need to do custom integration between each project, right? So I put uh, the storage layer on the bottoms, more execution uh, engines um, on the top. And yeah, if you want to be able um, to have a um, very efficient read from Parquet, for example, um, there's, so there's a common implementation in Parquet, which is um, like standard, but then each project had to do a custom integration to go really deep and have a, a vertical integration between the storage layer and their in-memory representation. Uh, so there's always this loading uh, step that needs to be optimized um, in particular for each of those projects. And then they have to do it for every system, right? And then if you need to integrate two of those, um, then each of them need to do a custom integration and they need to find a common representation for the data, right? And if you use, for example, uh, PySpark, which is running uh, Spark user-defined functions in Spark, uh, Python user-defined functions in Spark, the Python side is very efficient because you have native implementation of some of those operations. Uh, the Spark side is very efficient, but in between, there's a lot of waste in transforming the data from one to the other. And so on one end, Python, if you use Pandas or some of those, uh, they have their own custom representation in memory to be really fast. And then Spark has its own representation. It relies on to do the shuffle and move data around between nodes. And so there's a lot of waste um, just converting because usually this common representation is the least common denominator um, and it's not very efficient. So there's a lot of waste uh, in converting data and there's a lot of waste in effort because you need to do all these n square integrations to make everything work with everything. So starting with arrow, because the arrow representation is designed in a way then you can move it directly from memory to the wire back to memory without any kind of transformation. Then you remove all the costs for serialization to serialization. There's no serialization, uh, there's no marshalling in Arrow because you just move the buffer from memory to the network and from the network back to memory. So this cost, cost is completely removed and because we define it as a standard, and it's every project in memory representation, then you also remove the need from transforming it to the custom uh, in memory representation for those system. So you remove entirely all the overhead of serialization, deserialization, and you can do that because the representation is already efficient for doing vectorized execution, right? It's a columnar representation in memory. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why columnar and, uh, and you know, what's vectorized execution and why columnar is important. So if we start from the beginning, you know, when you represent a, a table, when you think about a table, it's two dimensional, right? You have columns and you have rows. But actually when you store it, whether on disk or in memory, it's actually going to be linear, right? So you need to pick if you represent it row-wise, so one row at a time in this linear representation, or column-wise, right? And so if row is kind of more natural, the problem with that is we're interleaving values of different types, right? So A's could be integers, B's could be variable length strings, C's could be dates, and then you're going to interleave values of different types. When, uh, if you store uh, as a column, then you have multiple values of the same type together and you can use better encodings uh, to store them. For example, if you have integers and you know that they're not larger than a certain value, and let's say that the maximum value is 1,000, then you know you can use fewer bits to, to store them. So in, instead of using uh, 64 bits at a time and in small values you use only the bits you need and you pack them and they're much, much smaller. Something you cannot do if you're storing an int next to a string. Uh, similarly, for strings, you can do um, delta encodings. For example, if you're sorting your data and you have common 
prefixes to string, you can take advantage of that to have a much more compact representation. Again, something you can do only because you put all the strings together of the same type. So there's a lot of tricks you can do like that, uh, that Columniat uh, allows and Parquet takes advantage of that. Now, uh, the other aspect is when you query data, usually you have many columns in your data set, right? You may have tens, dozens, hundreds, uh, sometimes thousands. Uh, but usually when you analyze it, you're looking only at a few columns, right? You select A, B, group by C or something. And so when you do that, you're going to need to read only those columns from the data. And so in a column layout, it makes it really easy because if, let's say I want to read only column B, I can see to the beginning of that column and again sc scan uh, all the values at once. When in the row layout, then you need to do a lot of small seeks um, and small scans, which is a lot less efficient. Um, the whole IO system will work much better by scanning big chunks. Um, so that's the other advantage. So now one question uh, I can get is, uh, A, why did you, did you just not put Parquet in memory? Well, the reason is um, there are different trade-offs between storage and in-memory, which is more transient. When you store the data, uh, you're going to store it once, and then you're going to read it many times for different point of views. So the projection case I just talked about, uh, where you read only a subset of the columns, um, is going to be one of the key things, right? We need to be able uh, to read only uh, some of the columns, um, depending on the query. And because of the, um, how a spinning disk work, reducing I.O is one of the key priorities, right? We will still want the decoding to be CPU efficient, but um, it's the main priority is reducing I.O. So looking at how we use projection, how we use uh, filtering, push down, to read as, uh, as few bytes as we can. And it's going to be mostly streaming access from that. So you, you start scanning the data and you, you read it all uh, sequentially. When in memory, we have different use cases. So first, it's in memory, so the latency of accessing memory is much, much smaller. So reducing I.O. is not as much a priority. It's still important as well, but you know, if we have a needle, we move between um, reducing CPU usage to reducing I.O. In arrow, it points more towards CPU, and in Parquet, it points more toward uh, I.O. because Parquet is more for disk and arrow is for memory and they have different latency um, restrictions. And also, when you have data in memory, usually you already have only the columns that you need in most cases because you loaded it specifically for a certain query execution. <clears throat> and um, and um, you also need random access. Look, if you're doing joins, for example, or hash aggregations in memory using this representation, uh, you will have a lot of times you need to, have, to be able to have random access. And so that dif changes how we lay out data. Right? In Parquet, uh, we have a representation that uh, excludes nulls, right? So you, uh, you have all the values next to each other without the nulls. In Arrow, we keep empty slots for nulls so that you can still have constant time random access to values by their index. So a little bit about Parquet. So Parquet supports um, nested data structures. Uh, they both do. Um, it's a compact format. Uh, it focuses on having type-aware encodings that are going to be both uh, better at compressing than a brute force compression algorithm like uh, you know, Snappy or uh, LZO or uh, GZIP, and uh, more efficient. Right, because if you can use dictionary encoding or bit packing on the data because you understand the types better than just byte sequence of bytes, you can do things that are much, much more uh, efficient at CPU-wise at decoding. Like looking up in a dictionary is a really cheap operation. <clears throat> and it's uh, optimizing the I.O. by doing both projection pushdown, reading only the columns that you need, and predicate pushdown which is taking advantage of the statistics in the file uh, to skip a bunch of uh, rows that you don't need to read. And so if you combine both, um, so you know, projection pushdown is the first one. 
uh, predicate push down is the second one is uh, skipping partitions in the data that you don't need to read based on stats, then you read only the data you need and you reduce your I.O. And um, I've been cheating a little bit because all my examples with tables are flat, but I say we support nasty data structures, including um, you know, lists and structs and arbitrarily nested data structures. Um, so there's um, ways that we store this data using um, things that are described in the Dremel paper as the repetition level and definition levels. And I'll send you to that uh, blog post I wrote and that explains this in details on how it works. But it's basically they're kind of general generalization of uh, using a bit to store versus some, whether something is null or not. Um, you know, you would say zero for null, one for define. Uh, and so when you have nested data structures, well, is null means, uh, is it null at the root? Like, so if you, we take the example of country here, it's document.name.language.country. So actually define here would be translated by instead of zero or one, you would say three to say country is defined. Uh, you would say two to say language is defined but country is null, and you would say one for name is defined but language is null. Right, so you can extend this notion of using a zero or one to say it's null to a small integer that says whether it's at what level it's null. And the repetition level is a similar notion for saying, hey, where does the list start for when you have nesting of lists? So if you have multiple lists uh, embedded into each other, you will use uh, same thing, a small integer to say, this is the beginning of this list at this nesting level, zero, one, two. And so the key point being, so it's just a generalization of using a bit for storing null on flat schemas. And it's a very small integers, so the tricks I've talked about, about bit packing can be used for storing those values, so we can store them with very little overhead to maintain the structure of the record. If you want the exact details, you can go to the blog post, and I'll post the slides afterwards. So now, I'm going to talk about Arrow uh, and how it's different. Um, so same thing, it's a, um, <clears throat> so it's a well documented and cross language uh, compatible like Parquet. So one of the goals from the beginning was not to have like in Hadoop world, sometimes you have a lot of configuration, which is provide the name of the Java class that implements whatever compression or different things. And it's kind of very opaque specification of what the binary representation is. And it's kind of hard to make it work outside of this Java class and outside of Hadoop. So both Parquet and Arrow uh, put the accent on being uh, binary specified, right? So we have both Java and C++ implementation for uh, both of them, which means we have Python integration um, using the C++ and people have experimenting doing R bindings, uh, JavaScript bindings for Node and different things like that. Um, and it's designed to um, get the maximum throughput out of modern CPUs, and I'll go over that, what that means. Uh, it's embeddable, it's something you use as a library in your query engines uh, or storage layers, and it's interoperable. Um, like Parquet, it deals with nested data structures uh, because that's what we have in real life uh, most of the time, and you, in a lot of cases, we don't want to be forced to put data in flat schemas. Um, and I will go over uh, those, um, those CPU um, characteristics uh, that we optimize for, being pipelining, uh, based on the, how the CPU pipeline works, uh, CMD, single instruction, multiple data, uh, which is about uh, evaluating the same instruction on multiple values at a time, and how the cache of the CPU works, and how uh, vectorized execution makes it work better. So if we look at the CPU pipeline, so you know modern CPUs um, don't execute one instruction after the other. Uh, you know, first CPUs were doing that, uh, but now a CPU is as an area, right? So um, there are multiple um, areas in the CPU that do different things. So um, the instruction has been decomposed in multiple steps in a pipeline, which means that the CPU will start executing the next instruction uh, before the previous one is finished. 
uh, which means that uh, the CPU needs to know what the next instruction is. So one common problem is branching. So whenever you have an if statement or a loop or a virtual function call, uh, you have a branch in your code, which means there's going to be a test. And based on the result of that test, we're going to go execute ex instruction A or instruction B, which means the CPU has to wait until this instruction is finished before starting the next one. Um, so to work around that, the CPU has a branch prediction algorithm, which in trying to guess, hey, look, what, which one of those two are we actually going to run next? And so the trick here is to make it really easy for the CPU to predict what the next instruction is going to be. Uh, one common thing, if you have a loop, and inside the loop you have an if, which is data de dependent, like say, if null, do something, or if greater than this value, do something, otherwise do something else, and your data is half of the time doing one way and half of the time doing the other way, kind of randomly, then the CPU is going to be wrong a lot of the time in predicting what the next instruction is going to be, right? Because it's data dependent, there's no way of uh, being very accurate at that. So the trick is, with vectorized execution and columnar representation, we want to turn things around. And so the ifs are moved as much as possible outside the loops, right? And the loops are really tight. You have a really tight loop that does the same thing over and over and over again, which means the branching algorithm will be doing exactly the same thing, and then at the end of the loop, it says, hey, am I doing this over again? And so the CPU is just predicting, yes, we're doing this over again, right? The branch prediction is just, oh, we're just looping, right? So it's always right, except the last time, uh, but the last time it's negligible, right? Because we just did a thousand times the same thing, and then we're wrong once. Um, so the time we wasted at the end is negligible. And so the main idea is, so here I'm representing right, the ideal case, everything goes one after the other, and misprediction introduces a bubble. And here in my pipeline, I have like four steps, but real pipelines are like a dozen, if not more steps. It depends on, the, on each uh, particular CPU. So misprediction introduces a lot of uh, wasted time, and so, that's where vectorized execution goes much faster because we focus on executing on one column at a time. So maybe we're going to do, uh, we have this big expression, but instead of evaluating this whole expression on the entire row, we focus on a subset of it on two columns. And maybe we do all the A plus Bs first. And so it's the same thing over and over. And maybe you do, we do all the if null in one step, and then we focus on all the defined values and we remove all the ifs and we move the ifs around the loops instead of inside of them. The other thing I mentioned uh, was CPU cache. And so, um, similarly, the CPU has to wait on the main memory uh, quite a bit because it can run much faster than it can fetch data from memory. So to work around that, uh, CPUs have cache uh, co-located with it uh, that, he, that is much faster than it can access much faster. So the thing is, you know, the cache is much smaller as well, so it needs to fetch data from RAM, put it in the cache, and it works on it. And so as long as it's working um, data, fits in the cache, and can go really fast, and every time it needs more data, well, it has to wait for it to arrive. So again, because in columnar execution, we focus on one column at a time, uh, and we, have, um, we can be much more focused on the memory aspect, um, this caching mechanism will be much more efficient. Because now, instead of fetching all the columns, because it's row-oriented, in the cache and working on that, we can focus on only the few columns we're working on, which means we're going to do a lot less of back and forth because we, we're much more focused. And so, again, it's removing a lot of latencies induced by the CPU just waiting on something to happen and the CPU can run at much uh, higher throughput. To, to sum up, uh, cache locality uh, is one aspect. Uh, Superscalar is a SIMD instruction. So because um, data is layout as all the values for the same column together, and we focus on executing everything column-wise instead of row-wise, um, we can tell the CPU to say, hey, look, we need you to ex execute the same instruction on all those values one after the other. And because of SIMD instruction, you get 
uh, literally four times the throughput on the data or more uh, as the SIMD instruction gets get wider. And the same thing that uh, you know, GPUs do to run faster. Uh, minimal uh, structure overhead, uh, constant uh, time value access, um, and you know, we can operate directly on columnar data. <clears throat> so I've talked about you know, how it makes the CPU faster, and now I'm going to talk about um, how uh, data is moved from uh, memory to um, network and uh, why uh, we get some uh, benefits there too. Uh, so Arrow is, uh, you, know, you, know, you have a schema that describes the data. So the first thing is to provide the schema. Um, and the schema, you know, we have all the primitive types uh, and defining, it goes uh, as far as defining all the time types, uh, you know, interval types, all the things you can find in SQL, or, and it's kind of trying to mix together the, the types from different worlds, like from SQL, from the Python analysis world, uh, all the things, and have a unified uh, schema representation uh, for nested data structures. And, uh, and the other uh, things you're doing at the beginning, so you need to provide the schema uh, potentially, you will have dictionary encoded uh, columns, and this is very useful, for example, in, um, if you're doing aggregations. When you're doing aggregations on strings, you, know, you do a group by strings, it needs to do a hash code for every one of those strings, and that's how the hash table works, right? You're going to compute the hash for the value, find it in a hash table, increment the value if you're doing like sum, for example, or count. Uh, now, if you dictionary encode its things first, uh, instead, you replace, you build a dictionary of all the existing values, uh, you attribute them an integers to represent them, and then you replace them all by integers. Which means, for example, aggregations or joints will be much faster because um, you have n values between 0 and n. So instead of using a hash table, you use a table. Uh, and you have a constant access to directly the values. There's no hashing to do anymore, and it's an exact position, so it's all much faster for doing aggregation joints and all kind of things. Uh, so you can provide a dictionary batch, which is the list of all the values, right? And which means in the record batch, we're going to represent the values by their ID instead of the actual value. Uh, so you negotiate schema, potentially provide one or more dictionaries if you dictionary encoded values, and then you can send a list of record batch. And so the data is split into record batches because the full data set may not fit in memory, but you're going to work on it one record batch at a time, uh, which is a, a smaller element that contains the values. So if we look at one example of uh, the columnar representation, so on the left, you, we have a JSON uh, representation of the data. And on the right, we have how it looks in uh, arrow. So I removed the nulls uh, for readability, but basically we use bit sets for uh, nulls, right? You have a bit for each value to d say if it's null or not. And as I said before, we leave an empty slot uh, for the uh, values. So if we look at age, which is a simple fixed width values, right, we may uh, use four bytes for every uh, integer value. They're just one after the other in uh, the error memory representation. If it's a variable length value like name, then you have all the values one after the other, and there's an offset vector that points at where each value starts, right? So if you know um, then you have constant time to access each value because you look at the offset and then you can look at the value and you know where it ends by looking at where the next value ends. And we are always have an extra offset at the end to avoid a special case that points to the non-existent after last value. And this offset vector mechanism is composable, right? If you have nested lists, lists, as I show on phones, is stored in the same matter, right? You have a list of variable length values, so you have the values one after the other. We have the offset vector for pointing where the values start in this value vector. And then we have another offset ve vector to say where the list starts. And so it's composable. If you have many levels of nestings of lists, then you add more offset vectors. <clears throat> 
And the way you send that on the wire, if you look at one record batch, you have a data header uh, with some metadata, like what's the size of each buffer, how many values we have in this record batch. And then it's simply every buffer one after the other. So that's where we can use a scatter gather uh, memory um, to send from memory to uh, network and network back to memory. Um, because those offset vectors, they're all relative, right? There's no pointer. It's not pointing at the absolute location in memory. It's a relative uh, offset based on the beginning of the vector, which means you can move the vectors around, the buffers in memory, or move them to disk or to network and back to memory, and they, you don't need to change anything to them for being able to read them. Um, so that's the, one of the key uh, property there. You can relocate them without changing the data, which means there's no serialization, deserialization involved. And so in RPC, you know, we just see you we avoid serialization, deserialization, um, and we're working on making a standard RPC representation. So the format is defined, and now we're working on standardizing the exchange of messages. Uh, of how you, um, you exchange them in a standard way. And IPC inter-process communication is, uh, if the two processes are on the same machine, you don't need to go through the network la layer to exchange data. Once you finish writing a record batch, it becomes immutable, right? You finish writing it, it's immutable, which means you can share it in read-only uh, to many different other processes if you want, and most likely to another process. Um, without having to worry about concurrent access, because anyway, it's read-only. Um, so there's some uh, experimentation that has been done with shared memory between C++ and Java. And so you can just generate the data, give a pointer to it to some other process, and then can read it. And so in that case, you know, for uh, inter-process communication, in the case where data is being transformed from uh, one process to the other, you still have a lot of conversion happening, right? Maybe it's serialized from in-memory representation of the first process to some wire representation to send to the other uh, process, and the other process copies it in its own memory to work on it, right? So there's a lot of uh, work involved uh, that is just copying data around, transforming to the right format. If both processes use the same in-memory representation and they can, and it's immutable, then you can just share a pointer and you remove the entire overhead of serializing, deserializing, and um, transforming uh, to a different representation. You remove the copy altogether. And so to give an example of what it looks like, uh, so if we look at this, is, this would be a query engine, and now a query engine would use uh, arrow um, so at the beginning, you know, and I imagine here you would have three nodes. So that's execution, right? So you, you, you think of, you have all the tasks in the Hadoop world, those things would be individual tasks. And, um, and we have three nodes in our cluster to imagine, but that would obviously scale to uh, more. And, and so what happens is you would have a vectorized scanner uh, reading from parking to a row. And then the partial aggregation happening on each node, in this case, so I'm taking this example of doing a select sum from a table grouped by some other column. And so what the uh, execution does, it will do partial aggregation. On each node, it prepares, uh, based on consistent hashing, it prepares partial aggregation that are going to be sent to the next uh, step in the execution for doing the full aggregation. Um, so, in some sense, in the Hadoop world, that's a map task and um, map plus combiner on the map side, and it prepares partial aggregation, and then each of them gets sent to the reducer side, um, and it's already um, in the right representation. So it's really just sending on the wire, copying to the memory of the next one, and the full aggregation is just finishing up the uh, sum from the partial aggregation and sending the uh, result through the result set to the user. Um, so that's uh, the example for that. And I talk about um, IPC and how you can use multiple processes. So if you think about 
if we take that example of uh, you have a SQL engine uh, and maybe it's lacking palettes and native uh, implementation or like uh, Drill or Hive or Spark SQL, it's a JVM process. And it does some operation and then you're calling a user-defined function you wrote in Python. And so what it used to, to do in PySpark, for example, is there would be a lot of conversions happening to make that possible. But now, and uh, I'll send you a link to the current integration between uh, Spark and uh, Python Pandas to use Arrow instead. Now, if uh, they have these common representations they share, the SQL engine is working on top of Arrow already, and it produces an input to the function, and the Python process, and maybe it's in the JVM on the top, the Python process is a native process, um, and it can access its memory in read-only, uh, read its input and produce its output in the same representation, and similarly share a pointer to it in read-only for the, to return to the SQL uh, execution engine, which means that we, again, remove all the overhead of transforming the data, uh, copying the data from one space to the other, because it doesn't need to. Right, and so it's now it's as efficient as if um, the thing has been whatever the native um, user-defined function API for the SQL engine, and it had to run in the same process. Now there's no overhead anymore of running the UDF in a different process that may not be the JVM, uh, and sending the data in between the two. We remove entirely this overhead, and so there's progress happening already. Uh, in Spark, for example, uh, to make that a reality. And so the other important point to this is now you can imagine user-defined function libraries that are actually portable. They work in every single SQL execution engine, right? So that, that's the future. The future here is instead of having user-defined function that work for Presto, that work for Hive, that work for Impala, uh, that work for drill, that work for pig, or whatever you're using, you have, they work for everything, right? You write your user-defined function once, and they work for all of them, and they work with no overhead. So you can imagine this universal uh, UDF API. <clears throat> so some, um, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the current status of the project and the future. Um, so Parquet, Arrow, both have uh, Java, C++ uh, first class uh, implementation, uh, which lead to um, Python, Pandas integration. There's some R, Ruby uh, bindings, JavaScript. Uh, someone has started the Node.js project to work with Arrow in Node.js and in, in JavaScript uh, implementation. Engine integration, so Arrow is started, Parquet is available, is virtually uh, all engines. <clears throat> and so if you're interested in the current activity, uh, the Spark integration is happening. Uh, you can follow uh, Spark 13, 534. Uh, dictionary encoding has been merged um, on both sides. Uh, Java and C++, we have integration testing to make sure they all work together all the time. Um, we are working, there's still work happening on uh, finalizing the time types, because I don't know if you're familiar with the time types in SQL, but if you look at uh, timestamp with time zone, without time zone, what's a time, what's an interval, uh, different types of interval, there's a lot of fun, and um, combining that with the type that exists in, in Python, um, and making sure everything works together, and we have a very uh, uh, precise definition of those types, uh, there's a lot of fun here, and so, but it's pretty close to being finalized. And so we have people from various projects uh, contributing and making sure uh, it makes sense for um, SQL, for Python, for um, all the different environments. Uh, some uh, more exotic bindings are happening. So we have a C++ implementation, but there are also C bindings, and C bindings actually open the door to a lot of different uh, language bindings that are based on C. Uh, you could have PHP uh, bindings if you want, if that's your thing. Um, some of the results, um, uh, I put some links here. Uh, the, the slides will be shared if you want to follow that. Uh, Wes McKinney 
I was been working on the C++ side of those things with the Pandas guy. Uh, has been putting a bunch of uh, blog posts, uh, some of them are linked here. I'm currently working on the spec for defining this Euro standard RPC REST API. So people already exchange uh, RPC based on uh, Euro, um, but uh, what we want is to define a standard one so that um, uh, we're good. So now time's up. Um, so, and that's my next, last slide. I skipped the example. You had pretty examples. Uh, some of the things that have been talked about and uh, <clears throat> on that, I'm going to thank you. And, uh, and if you want to contribute, uh, feel free to join the community. If you have questions, I'll be uh, around after the talk.